Okay. <clears throat> let's then go to Asia as I promised. And let's see another potential conflict and problem of cultural legitimacy between uh, human rights and uh, uh, another allegedly mo monolithic uh, um, cal uh, universal value that sometimes is so called uh, uh, the Asian uh, uh, one. I mean, the first thing perhaps one should say about this idea of a uh, uh, challenge posed by Asian values against uh, human rights is that uh, there is not just one Asia. Uh, I mean, to put in the same category realities that are as different as China on the one hand, uh, India on the other hand, uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, that was also mentioned before, uh, uh, and also to identify what Confucianism uh, as uh, the religion or so called quasi religion, because Confucianism is more a sort of moral uh, teaching than religion. When, uh, as you know, India is probably the biggest Muslim country in the world in the sense that it has more Muslims than any other, any other um, country uh, in the world, including, of course, Saudi Arabia and the others, is a little bit tricky. But still, to the extent in which there was a debate uh, on the relation between Asian values, Asian in general, and, uh, uh, and human rights, I think it's uh, important to say something about that as well. I have always found this paper by Xiaorong Li another expat, no, accidentally, yeah, perhaps one of the things I should say is that I've, I have my own views, of course, on uh, the relation between human rights and uh, these two potential challenges, and I've selected the, the people I like most, given my intuitions, of course, so you should be uh, alerted that I'm not giving you the accepted uh, and revealed the truth about this matter, but I'm simply backing my intuitions with people who know more than me about this stuff. So, uh, given this general premise, uh, I think that uh, Tsiarong Li makes an excellent work in first clarifying precisely what we mean by human value, uh, Asian values or Asian view uh, 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 or things like that, and then to you know, once she has articulated this amorphous Asian uh, set of values into at least four major components, uh, she has a reply for three of them mainly, although she makes an interesting point also about the first one. Okay, so uh, when Xiaorong Li talks about Asian uh, values, she tries to uh, appeal to official documents, for example the white paper issued by China at the very beginning of uh, uh, the period that led to the great economic uh, growth uh, that has now, 20 years, almost 30 years later, the first uh, reform and introduction of market economy in China uh, to the point uh, of having China as one of the two major economic powers, if not now the uh, most, uh, the largest uh, and strongest economy uh, in the, on the planet. Um, so this white paper contains the official uh, take of uh, the Communist Party on uh, this business of uh, uh, human rights. Uh, the other um, official declarations she takes uh, are uh, from uh, President Yi uh, Liu in uh, Singapore. Uh, you know, Singapore is an interesting case study because it's an, almost a dictatorship, uh, but with uh, fantastic uh, as well. Uh, economic numbers. Um, so this idea of purely meritocratic society, um, open to free market but with uh, a questionable record of uh, 
democratic standards being met because uh, the, the, there is only one party that yeah has election now and then but uh, through certain um, expedience it manages to remain in power and have the kind of consensus moving from 60% to 80%. We used to say a few years ago in Europe it's a Bulgarian democracy to say that yeah it has a lot of consensus but there is no liberal check on, uh, on what happens within the society. Okay so um, it's not a that Xiaorong Li went and made uh, interviews with, um, with Asian people. I mean, uh, since she thinks that Asian values are pretty much the expression of Asian elites, she took the official documents issued by uh, Asian uh, elites uh, uh, when relevant to this business of human rights. So what are Asian values. Um, she thinks that this can be articulated in four major uh, theses. One is that rights are, cult are culturally specific, which means that yeah, it's a form of relativism uh, that says that um, you cannot have a list of rights from nowhere there is always a culture that generates a number of rights and if that is the case, if there is this um, um, relation of generation, one culture generating a certain number of rights, it doesn't make sense to take the rights generated by one specific culture and apply it ipso facto to a different cultural context. The second thesis that makes uh, this universe of value often referred to as Asian values is that the community has priority over the individual. So uh, if the rights of the individual have to be sacrificed for the well-being and uh, um, development of uh, uh, the community, uh, apparently this is something that Asians want. Third, socio-economic rights have priority over civic and political rights, so it's more important not to start than to be able to express freely one's opinion, just to put it down crudely. Um, it's important to have access to uh, food, shelter and water um, then uh, uh, being uh, recognized and uh, protected in uh, one's ability to <coughs> express uh, political views, uh, exercise uh, one's own religion, practice one's own religion, and so on and so forth. And finally, rights, which is not to be completed with number one, rights are a matter of national sovereignty. It takes always uh, a well-defined uh, political authority to generate uh, a set of rights. Where do human rights come from? Uh, would be the, the question here. What is the authority that is behind human rights? When we talk about Brazilian law, when we talk about Italian law, when we talk about Chinese law, we have a state that has a procedure for generating pieces of law but, you know, human rights, you know, yeah, treaties were ratified, but there is certainly no central authority um, that is the ultimate legitimate, legitimatizing entity for uh, those rights. Okay, so... Um, she makes, uh, as I said, reference to uh, various um, official documents issued by a few uh, uh, Asian governments to back uh, each of these uh, claims, for example, about the cultural specificity. This China 1999 white paper stated that 
owing to tremendous differences in historical background, social system, cultural tradition and economic development, countries differ in their understanding of and practice of human rights. So notice, it's not that they say we don't want human rights, we want our interpretation of human rights. Um, about the second one, again, uh, no, this time the Singapore government uh, who issued these shared values in 1991 and states that an emphasis on the community has been a key survival value for Singapore. Um, so it is precisely our uh, commitment to the well-being of the community that uh, explains the success, the economic success that we are having. Therefore, uh, we don't want these rights that are individualistic by nature. Okay, third uh, quotation to back claim number three. Again, the Chinese white paper, the, um, to eat their fill and dress warmly were the fundamental demands of the Chinese people who had long suffered cold and hunger. Um, so, the right to economic development is more important than the individual political and civic rights. And since the first generation of human rights is pretty much about civic and political rights, there is a problem at the very beginning. As I told you, this com potential conflict between civic and political rights and social economic rights is also well captured by the, the fact that we have two international treaties about human rights. One uh, about civic and political rights, the other one about social economic rights that were signed by two different group of countries in the 60s. The first one signed by the liberal countries, the you know, Western countries, the other one by those in the Soviet bloc. Uh, and it was you know, only recently that there was a sort of universal ratification, with few exceptions, uh, of both countries, of both treaties. And uh, about the fourth, um, there is this idea again from the 1991 white paper in China the issue of human rights falls by and large within the sovereignty of each state uh, and later in 1995 um, the, the Communist Party in China confirmed the opposition to some countries hegemonic acts of using the double standard for the human rights of other countries and imposing their own pattern on others and interfering in the internal affairs of other countries by using human rights as a pretext. So you see uh, that these uh, uh, four uh, tenets are pretty much reflect accurately the ideology at least of the elites in power in the even in a leading Asian countries such as China. Okay, what Xiang Li does is to pretty much criticize each of these claims, especially the last three. I mean the thing that she says about the first one almost en passant is uh, that uh, to say that rights are culturally specific is if not anything else a genetic fallacy. What is a genetic fallacy? A genetic fallacy is the mistake of taking the origin of a certain idea or principle as uh, all that counts or something that counts for judging about its intrinsic validity. So it may be, although the claim itself is questionable, that freedom of expression or freedom of religion uh, is an invention of the West, or that democracy is an invention of the West. I mean, if you ask Amartya Sen, he say, no, 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 that's not true. You should see that, or tolerance. Um, Amartya Sen would disagree, but let's concede that it was invented by the West. Still, this says nothing 
about whether uh, Asian people, it would be in the interest of Asian people to have the right to freedom of expression. So you have to show me that uh, human rights are not good for us, even if I concede to you that they have a Western flavor, that they have a liberal flavor, that's not enough, it's actually completely irrelevant uh, to the question of whether you know, Asian people uh, should not adopt um, those rights. Um, what about the second, so that's the genetic fallacy, what about the second claim that the community has priority over the individual? Well, um, a little bit like we said when we criticized this appeal to self-determination, the value of self-determination without qualification, uh, Xi'an Li says that there is a double conflation here. Um, when there is this appeal uh, to the priority of the community and its well-being over the individual and uh, his or her rights, on the one hand, there is a conflation between community and state. So, what the claim is usually meant to do is to say that the state, as a political entity, has priority over the individual, not the community, because our political leaders who make this argument. But it's not really about, you know, whether one is to sacrifice for some, at least, of its rights for the sake of other people who are around him uh, in the community he or she lives in, but it's really the sacrificing of one's rights, one's individual rights for, for what the state says, to comply with, with, with what the state says. And that would be the first completion. But the, the, the worst conflation is perhaps the conflation between state and present government. So in appealing to this, uh, okay, uh, I'm not going to give you freedom of expression because in here uh, the community takes priority over the individual. I mean, Sierra says, wait a minute, what you are really saying is that you don't let me express my political views, you don't let me constitute a political party, you don't let me oppose your decisions in a, in a democratic way or in a free and uncoerced way because, you, because the government has priority over the individual, not the community, because your views of this present government uh, uh, are uh, more important than my rights. Uh, and so you see the analogy that I saw with the question of self-determination. Uh, when, when you appeal to the idea of self-determination, you, you need to be careful who is the self there. Because it's one thing if it's the people, you know, really, uh, the sum of all the individuals within a society, it's a completely different thing if you're talking about a, the, the part of the society that is in power, that exercises political power and the rest. So something like that is also going on here. Okay, what about the third that seems to be at least prima facie the most um, reasonable uh, part of these Asian values, um, univer uh, universal value? It is true that you know it's more urgent to avoid starvation than uh, you know, to be able to print a paper that criticizes the government. Um, so what is the problem that Xiaorong Li sees about this third component? Well, of course it's a false dilemma. I mean, there is no reason to believe that by conceding civic and political rights you are slowing or making economic growth more difficult than it would be with civic and political rights. Um, I mean, one of the things that could be mentioned here is Sand's famous thesis that freedom is development. 
that it's not a freedom causes development or produces economic growth. Yeah, is economic growth. I mean, uh, basically, a society that is less free than another one is ipso facto poorer than another one. So it's not the case that the relation between freedom understood at civic and political and development has to be reduced to a causal relation in which freedom causes economic growth or is a presupposition of, or a necessary condition of it's not a necessary condition. And China shows that you have you can have very limited individual freedom and a lot of economic growth. If Amartya Sen is right, the idea is that by limiting individual freedom, ipso facto, you make the society less rich, less wealthy than it could be with uh, maximum freedom from, for, uh, for individuals. And the argument is twofold there. On the one hand, there is the idea that only democracies have averted famines, famous Sen's point, that democracies have never gone through famines, uh, whereas non-democracies have. But the more interesting one is really a point about um, uh, the direct relation that there is between uh, individual freedoms and uh, the ability to, for uh, each individual to um, contribute efficiently to the growth of the society by expressing its own capability, using its capabilities at its full extent. So it's a false dilemma according to Xiaorong Li because there is no evidence that tells us that for example China would have been less successful in economic terms <laughs> if it had had a more uh, open uh, uh, policy about human rights. So it, it is true, I mean what China shows is that you can have a lot of economic growth without individual freedoms. That's hard to deny. Uh, they have been without full uh, freedom in civic and political rights. They have had, of course, rights to private property, they have rights to contract law, to <coughs> business, uh, to enterprise, and so on and so forth. But as we know, they don't have an inter the, the same internet that we have. Uh, they don't have different political parties. They don't have, have elections. They have uh, so they don't have civic and political rights. Quite simply, and nonetheless, they have become the most powerful um, country in the world in, ter in economic terms. But of course, this is still insufficient to say that their performance, their economic performance, would have been worse if civic and political rights were given to Chinese people. Um, so that's that's what Xiaorong Li has to say about. Uh, this idea that social economic rights have priority over civic and political ones, which is a claim that, of course, the Asian value official views uses to say uh, the whole uh, orientation of the human rights uh, of documents that seem to give priority to what Amnesty International cares about. Right? Amnesty International, it's unusual that makes a complaint or a public campaign uh, because people are poor. What they usually do is that, you know, when you are put in prison for your views, uh, an Amnesty International campaign starts right away. Um, so, in a sense, it is true that there is a kind of leaning in favor of what I usually call negative rights in the human rights domain, uh, or at least it is true that from a is it true? No, it's not even true that from a from an historical perspective, civic and political rights came before social and economic, because already in the Universal Declaration there are a lot of rights that are concerned with 
um, avoidance of starvation, having a decent wealth, having access to healthcare, stuff like that have nothing to do with civic and political rights. So, okay. Um, then, rights as a matter of social sovereignty. Um, well, um, what I was telling you, the idea that um, it always takes a well-defined political authority to uh, issue uh, a, a body of law and in the case of human rights it's not clear what this political authority would be short of universal government uh, uh, as we are. Well, um, I guess that uh, here views may legitimately vary depending on whether you are a cosmopolitan or a state-centered uh, uh, theoretician, um, but uh, among the many things one could say, and perhaps here Ignatieff is, the, is, a, is an author that we might want to use, is that it is not true that the authority of rights always presupposes uh, uh, a political uh, entity such as the state <coughs> and that um, the most human rights can hope for is to become part of the international law with all the problems that we know about international law. I mean, there are still juries to believe that international law is not different than morality which they, and by that they mean that counts nothing. <laughs> if there is no sanctionary power be, be, behind the law, yeah, we can discuss because it's fascinating, but we are not talking about rights. Um, I mean, there is some truth to that, to that idea, of course, but as, I, as Ignatius says, we would be careful because there is an intrinsic revolutionary power in, uh, even in a declaration. So, as long as you, know, you accept this declaration, you ratify, ratify, ratify a treaty, as long as you sign this declaration, then you commit yourself to a certain number of consequences. So, in the case of the post-colonial movement, the anti-colonial movement, sorry, I mean, it was precisely the fact that the colonial powers had signed the Universal Declaration that entitled colonies to say, well, wait a minute, you signed the declaration that says that each people has the right to self-determination. So, I think at this point, uh, please go away because uh, you you don't say that we are the same thing. You are here as you know a dominant power, and I want to get independence. Um, and of course, in addition, I mean uh, the power of rights also depends on the kind of consensus that they have uh, in, in the global public conscience, as it's sometimes called. It's not just a question of, is there a policeman who can go there and uh, ensure that that human right is enforced? Um, if there is consensus among human rights, human rights have concrete consequences. I, I was telling you uh, about the case of Turkey and uh, their problem to enter the European Union. Um, I mean, uh, they can be used as standards that have far-reaching and huge political consequences, um, not to mention the simple fact that uh, within, especially within uh, um, international uh, governmental associations such as the European Union, uh, they can be transformed into pieces of international law that is valid uh, uh, on, um, on the territory covered by that association. So uh, I was mentioning the, the, the International uh, Court of Human Rights, the one that Rusconi appealed to because he was saying uh, that uh, when he was judged unable to do politics in virtue of the fact that he was sentenced um, uh, for 
not paying taxes in one of his companies, um, he said that, that um, the application of uh, the principle on non illegibility of people who were sentenced that came after the facts that made him uh, uh, the, the crime that he committed did not uh, is illegitimate because it's like predating the application of the law. And so he made an appeal and nobody knows what's going to happen. In fact, he's hoping that the European Court of Human Rights says, no, no, that ruling was not, was not legitimate and therefore he can go back and do politics. Thank God, at least, it takes a lot of time for this judge to reply. Otherwise, we could have had him as a political leader more than he was, because of course he campaigned and everything, but at least he could not be a candidate. Um, so, uh, why did I talk about Berlusconi? Oh, okay, just to, yeah. It's a paradoxical case, but it's hard to say that in the contemporary world human rights do not have practical consequences simply because there is no world government around in the world. It's not exactly like that. So rights are not a matter of national sovereignty, uh, and uh, um, at least not all rights are a matter of national sovereignty, uh, and uh, even uh, this uh, last piece of uh, the so-called uh, Asian view uh, is questionable. So just to use to go a little bit farther, I think she says the answer depends on how one understands the concept of universality and cultural specificity. In essence, there are three ways in which a value can be universal or culturally specific. First, this term may refer to the origin of a value, the first point. In this sense, they represent a claim about whether a value has developed only within specific culture or whether it has a reason within the basic ideas of every culture. And no one on either side of the Asian values debate thinks that human rights are universal with respect, with respect to their origin. Uh, second, a value may be culturally specific or universal with respect to its prospect for effective, immediate implementation, that is, a value may find favorable condition for its implementation only within certain cultures, or it may find such condition everywhere in the world. So when we say human rights are universal, uh, we uh, may mean uh, this uh, problem of how likely are they to be implemented only here or everywhere. Uh, and the third the value may be understood as culturally specific by people who think it is valid only within certain culture, which is a farther point. And according to this understanding, a value can be explained or defended only by appealing to assumptions already accepted by a given culture. Uh, in cultures that do not share this assumption, the validity of such a value will become questionable. Now, you see here, about this third point, this takes us back to the point that was making Anahim. Anahim would agree with this last point. A, a, a right can be, in a certain sense, valid or perhaps prone to implementation only if uh, it is in line with the, the culture of the context in which it is uh, to be applied. Um, and uh, I think that uh, also uh, Tiara Ongli agrees with this general idea of, let's call it cultural universality. Uh, you have to show that human rights are not at odds with uh, the culture and uh, uh, shared beliefs of a certain uh, cultural context, otherwise they perhaps are not the human rights you want, are not the right list. It's, so we go back to the point I, I tried to make since the very beginning, a fascinating feature of the philosophy of human rights is that you are obliged not to 
philosophize from nowhere. But at the same time, you don't want to fall prey of this superficial uh, common places about you know Asian values or uh, the intrinsic incompatibility between Islam and human rights and you want to dig a little bit deeper into this alleged incompatibility because many of them such as in this case seem to be grounded on uh, a interested interpretation of certain cultural traits um, that is not so difficult to unmask after all. Okay, so let me ask you whether there are questions or comments or criticisms or of this, whether you believe that human rights are in the end are nonsense upon stilts as famously Jeremy Bentham thought of them. Uh, otherwise, I think that, what time is it? Well, it's a little bit before 12, but I guess that <coughs> we can also, yeah? I, think I have a kind of general question. Okay. Sure. So we saw this morning that we have uh, Asian values, let's say Islamic world and uh, the West. And uh, if it's true that, as you said about the Jewish uh, it's not the case that if you are in a, if living in a national state, you cannot appeal to a supranational European court of human rights. It's also true that. Uh, states are in a kind of state of nature among them. or the supranational organizations, let's say, or this couple of Asian countries, Islamic countries, and so on. So in analogy with uh, why you need to go out of the state of nature and to institute a state to protect Right. Is it not the case that we need today a better world governance, either by reforming in a very substantial way the UN, or to think about a kind of not a global state in the sense of a kind of imperialistic uh, state, but a, a world state? Yeah, I mean, to, to, if you agree that the human rights are binding. Yeah, I normally yeah. strong. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you ask a big question, of course, uh, and of, as you know, a very Kantian one because Kant, you know, sometimes likes the world government, sometimes says the oh my God, the world government is the just you know one step away from the u universal dictatorship, and we don't want to run this risk, so it's better to go with the surrogate of the international federation. Um, but your interesting question is whether human rights need world government or perhaps uh, a different international law. Uh, well, to the first question I am tempted to say that they have already proven that they can live also without a world government. Um, after all, they are pretty old now, they are 70 years old, they are not as old as the Magna Carta, but it's not an acquisition of yesterday. And, uh, as I said repeatedly, they have already shown to be able to produce political consequences, not as much as we would like them to do. So if the question is, should we have stronger, more developed, more um, or spread also in other parts of the world international organizations that make human rights part of their constitutional uh, credo, of course. Um, this, you know, I think that human rights would be much better protected if uh, something like the European Union uh, could be 
characterizing also parts of the uh, of other of, of the rest of the world, um, and um, so do we need more international law and more international governmental uh, or perhaps also non-governmental organization? Yes. Um, do we need? Um, well, then the question is, what kind of international organizations? Also, you know, the Communist Bloc was an international organization, if you want. <laughs> and it's questionable where it was very friendly to human rights. So, so we need a certain kind of international organization. But do we need also the further step of a world government? <coughs> I don't know the answer to that. I I think I share my preoccupation with the potential, the intrinsic potential of um, the generation towards dictatorship uh, of one government, unless, like the cosmopolitan Democrats want, you think of a very articulated form of government in which basically you have certain competencies that are left at lower levels of the government. So, for example, Brazil could still be uh, the only sovereign authority to decide uh, uh, how much taxes the Brazilian citizens should pay or how to defend the Amazon uh, uh, area and so on and so forth. But when it comes to environment, uh, global trade uh, or other areas, those would be the competencies of, of the world government. Uh, you know, it's, it's a tricky issue here, and it's, let me be surprisingly a little bit like a Schmittian here. This idea of having different competencies, it's good up to a point, uh, because there is one competence that is very hard for a state to give up, and it's national defense. It's the army. Because once you have given that up, it's no longer the case that you are sovereign on any other areas. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's an accident that we have given to the European Union, we individual states within Europe, we have given to Europe a lot of competences. Europe decides how big the seashell have to be to for them to be commercialized, seriously. It goes that, that specific. If it is too small, according to a European law, you cannot sell these seashells. So it's pretty pervasive, European law, in the lives of European cities. But European defense is not accidentally so strong, so difficult to achieve. So why am I making this point? I'm making this point that to show that it is possibly it is possible in, in principle to have a world government that is restricted only to certain competences. But then, if uh, the power to implement the decision of this uh, government is not backed by force, it's likely the case that it will be important. Vice versa, if it is backed by political uh, <coughs> sanctionatory power, it means that it has <coughs> true authority uh, on, on the, the states that remain down there. And at that point, uh, yeah, it gets a little bit scary. Uh, because you have no, no other place to go to. If it, if, you know, if it translates into a dictatorship. Uh, so, I don't know the answer to your question, honestly, but I, I, I see problems, uh, and probably problems of principle. I mean, I think that the cosmopolitan Democrats make it too easy when they say, okay, no, sure, I don't want a world government in the sense that there is only one parliament in the world, that this world government decides everything, uh, and so on and so forth. I just want this government to be restricted to certain well-defined competencies. 
I'm not sure that that's that simple. Um, I'm afraid that's all I, I can answer. Yeah? Um, I don't know if it's just my impression, but during uh, this mini course, I couldn't quite uh, uh, perceive, notice any sort of uh, theory that could deal properly with some more recent phenomena, uh, world phenomena, specifically, especially, environmental mm -hmm. crisis. And to my mind, I think uh, this sort of change that must happen theoretically might um, change the way uh, human rights have been considered so, considered far. so far. Because in, in, in some way, if there is no um, majority concerning decisions that must be taken um, worldly, everyone is going to suffer the consequences. No matter how each country may 